Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for this family that you have called us into, that we get to be called children of God, and you are our Father, and you love us deeply, and we've been brought into this community of brothers and sisters that also love you and are seeking to follow you and to know you more. And God, I pray that we would treasure that and see just what a rich honor that is. I pray this morning as we talk about just fellowship and friendships and this family that we belong to and being part of the church. Um, God, I pray that you would motivate us to want to be part of this, that we wouldn't want to just sit on the sidelines and observe, but that we would understand the richness of possibilities that there are in, in friendships here in this church community. And I pray that you would help us to develop those kinds of friendships so that we can be encouraged along this journey that we're on. Um, we thank you so much for your love for us and your word and your son, Jesus, who gave his life so willingly that we might be redeemed out of sin and error and darkness and into your everlasting kingdom, a kingdom of grace and love. And I pray that our lives would bring great glory to your name as we seek to follow you. Just bless our time this morning, we pray. Amen. Open your Bible with me to uh, 3 John, and we're going to do something I bet you never thought would happen at Maricopa Springs. We are going to knock out an entire book of the Bible in one Sunday, believe it or not. 3 John is that uh, small letter that John wrote way in the back of your Bible, close to Revelation. And we're continuing this series called Heartbeats, where we are exploring a number of different things that the church needs to be committed to in order to sustain the life of our congregation. And today I've titled my sermon Forever Fellowship, which is a really cheesy title, which is why I don't normally title sermons because I'm just not good at it. Um, but the idea that I want to get at this morning is that the relationships that you have with your fellow believers, particularly here at Maricopa Springs, they have an eternal quality to them. They are in a sense, everlasting. This little community of friends that we are building together is a forever fellowship. I mean, think about this. There's very little in your life that has uh, an eternal quality to it. There's very little in this life that you will be blessed to take with you into the next life. I mean, the career that you might ambitiously being, be pursuing, you can't take that with you. Whatever hobbies you spend your free time doing, those won't go with you into eternity. You're not going to take your retirement account, as I'm sure you know. Even this body that you have that's currently in this perishable form, that doesn't go with you in the same form that it's in now, which means that your workout regimen and your uh, efforts to be in good shape, that ultimately doesn't go with you. It's not really eternally significant. Your trophies... Your personal achievements, your certificates, none of those things matter in the life to come. Probably most difficult for me to accept is that all the books that I treasure on my shelf, those don't go with me into eternity either. But the one thing, or I guess I should say one of the few things that will go with you into eternity are the relationships that you build with your fellow Christians. The friendships that you develop within the family of God have an eternal quality to them. And if we're honest, I mean, it's difficult to live this life keeping eternity in mind, isn't it? Um, we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to store up treasures for ourselves where moth and rust don't destroy, where uh, they'll last forever in the kingdom of God, in the new heavens, in the new earth. And I think Christian friendships are one of those things that we can store up, one of those treasures that we can lay aside for the life to come. But it can be hard to keep eternity in mind when life is busy and crazy and there's so many different things that make demands on our life. And I want to point out too that, that these friendships that we as Christians are developing are more than just eternally significant, although they are that. They're also significant right now. They're meaningful in this moment. They're a blessing for the present too. The church is meant to be a family of friends. And if you've ever had a good friendship, then you know that there are a few things in life that bring as much 
joy to life as a good friendship. And we're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to enjoy fellowship with one another in the same way that a family does and also in the same way that friends do. So this morning, I want to encourage you to tap into the potential that is present in the body of Christ in the friendships that God might allow for you to develop with other people in this room. And the truth is that if the church falls short of the ideal for the community that God lays out for his people in Scripture, that the church should be a family of friends, then really what we can't rightly be understood to be a church. All we are would be sort of a loose association of people, you know, sharing something in common. Uh, my wife and I got a membership to Costco a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, I sort of thought, is the church like a Costco membership where, like, you, you kind of get your card and you sort of get some member benefits and there's other people that belong, but that's about it? Or is the church meant to be something more? And I would say without real fellowship, we can't rightly call ourselves the body of Christ. We would only be merely some kind of religious club. And the church under that premise could continue to gather and meet and worship God, but without functioning like a family of friends, you wouldn't call a church like that alive. You wouldn't call it something that is like the body of Christ. And it certainly doesn't live up to the standard that God has given his people for one heart and one mind united together in Christ. So we're going to read John, 3 John. But let me set this up real quick a little bit more. 3 John is the shortest book in the Bible, and I think it's kind of a weird book for God to have included in the Scriptures. And the reason is because you don't see the word Jesus in here anywhere. It doesn't talk about grace. There's not a real clear presentation of what the gospel is. Instead, what we're seeing is a real intimate personal letter between the Apostle John and a friend of his named Gaius. And it's really a letter of recommendation for a guy named Demetrius, along with a short warning about another guy named Diotrephes, who is a false teacher and not a good guy. And again, you might wonder, like, why are we reading a personal letter of recommendation about a couple of dead guys from 2,000 years ago? Why is that in, in the Bible? Well, I think there's lots of reasons to read this letter, and I believe with all my heart, this is the inspired Word of God. It, it belongs in your Bible, and there's lots that you could mine out of this book. But today, I simply want to say that we're reading it because as a family of friends, that's how I'm going to describe the church, a family of friends, there's a lot about friendship that we can glimpse in this letter and we can draw from this letter. I think it's ripe with a kind of loving, affectionate friendship that God causes to blossom among his people as they fellowship together and together seek Jesus. So this book is not primarily about uh, friendship or fellowship. That's true, but it's so saturated with relational affection that there's so much that we can draw. It's a beautiful picture of what a meaningful Christian community could look like. So as we read this together, that's kind of what I want you to be on the lookout for, all right? So if you have your Bible open, we're going to read 3 John. It says, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it's a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth." I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. 
And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who would want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. So starting in verse 2 here, we see John offer a prayer of real genuine care for body and soul to his friend Gaius, whom John says emphatically that he loves in truth. And John's reference to the health of Gaius' soul, I think reminds us that we are immortal creatures. There's so much more to who we are than just the bodies that we see. Through our faith in Jesus, we will truly live forever. And by referencing the soul, I think John hints at this idea that the friendship that he shares with Gaius, which has begun now in the flesh, it's never going to end because the soul is everlasting. And even more than that, we could add that we as Christians, we believe that the body will be raised from the dead. One of the things that's unique about Christianity is it neither shuns the metaphysical, the spiritual, nor the physical. We believe that we are body and soul. And one day, even though our bodies are now perishable, through our faith in Christ, God will raise this flesh imperishable. And we will live forever with new bodies. And so the friendships that we now share as brothers and sisters in Christ, they're established in the bodies that we currently have. They're connected to these immortal souls that God has given us. And one day that will all be completed in perfection in the resurrection. And what I want you to kind of get at this point is that you are already connected to something with immeasurably vast implications. You can't even comprehend the vastness and the meaningfulness of the implications that your body and soul will live forever And that you are now already in relationship with people who will also live with you forever in God's kingdom. The life that you now live touches eternity and therefore your Christian friendships also touch eternity even now. Uh, It's a little bit like driving around. I looked this up on the Interstate 90 which starts in Seattle. You can putz around that thing throughout the city of Seattle and, and it's meaningful in that context. But you can also hop on that road and you can drive 3,000 miles all the way to Boston on that one road. And the fellowship that we now share as a church, even now, it runs into eternity to the throne of grace. We're driving these friendships around Maricopa, if you will. But they span time and eternity and they stretch all the way into God's kingdom come. That's significant. If you look at verse 3, John tells us that this is a fellowship that's centered around the unchanging truth that Jesus is Lord. In, In some ways, we're all on one journey together, having been saved by God for his purposes. And part of that journey is that we're being sanctified in this truth by God's grace. And this family of friends that we belong to leads us to rejoice in God for the good things that he's given us, one of those things in particular being beautiful friendships. As we walk this journey together, sort of having each other's backs and bearing with one another and holding each other up and praying for one another. And there's no greater joy for John, he says, than to hear of God's people walking together in truth because there's no higher ambition for human life than to follow in the footsteps of Jesus in truth. And there's no greater human association then than the association that we have together as a family united around that one name, the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you notice as we read this letter that in this short letter, John uses a word that's kind of a favorite of his four times. And that's the word beloved. 
And maybe you have the New International Version that you read from. I read from the ESV. But I looked this up. Uh, in a couple other translations, they use the word instead of beloved or the words dear friend. And as much as I love the ESV, I, I like that translation, dear friend. And I think it's a, a little closer to the way that we speak. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't use the word beloved very often, just in my daily language. Beloved is a powerful word of endearment, but since it's kind of unfamiliar to us in our common daily speech, I think inserting the words here or translating this word dear friend really helps us see the kind of relationship that John has with Gaius. And uh, this is not a relationship that's unique to John or unique to this book. Paul uses the same word in a number of different places to refer to his friends Tychicus, Epaphras, Onesimus, Luke, and Philemon. And Peter at one point uses it to refer to Paul. So this is a rather common kind of language to the New Testament. It's describing the kinds of friendships that Jesus establishes among his people. And it shows up again in verse 5 where we see John encouraging his dear friend Gaius to receive Demetrius, although he's a stranger, and send him on to continue the ministry work that he's doing in a manner worthy of God. The picture we get here is that Demetrius is not the first sort of traveling missionary teacher to be sent from one church to another. And he's not the first to be sent to Gaius. Gaius has been faithful to receive these strangers on the recommendation of the apostles or some other church and show them hospitality, welcome them in. And John's really confident that Gaius will do that again with Demetrius because the shared love that they have for Jesus makes these people an extended family. So I think a wonderful principle can be drawn from what John uh, praises Gaius for here. What I want you to see is that even though the word hospitality isn't used here, John equates hospitality with faithfulness. In the body of Christ, hospitality is a form of faithfulness. He says in verse 5, this is a faithful thing that you do. Let's say it another way. I'm eager on the day that I stand before Jesus to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I think if we could sit down and interview John, he would tell us one of the ways that we can hear God say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, is to show hospitality. Because God himself has been hospitable to us. One of the character traits of our God is that he's hospitable, he's, he's welcoming. I looked up hospitality to just see what kind of some of the synonyms are in the dictionary. And some other words that were offered are friendliness or kind-heartedness. Hospitality could be an open home where you welcome other people into it. But I think hospitality is also an open heart where you welcome other people into your life. And the fact of the matter is that although some people in this room may be strangers to you, you have everything in common with them because you have Jesus Christ in common. I mentioned in our teaching through 1 John many months ago that actually you have more in common with your fellow believers in this room than you have in common even with your own mother or brothers and sisters biologically if they don't love Jesus. And this shared love for Jesus should allow us, I think, to welcome one another with friendliness, with kind-heartedness. And out of that flows uh, an ex extending our heart out towards one another. And God, in, in, doing, in, in us being faithful to that, God is surely going to bear fruit in our lives and in our community. And so a strong and healthy Christian community is one where People are faithfully extending a heart of hospitality, welcoming one another, fellowshipping with one another. Now look again there in verse 5. John says, you'll do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Um, look, John is obviously telling Gaius to welcome Demetrius and literally set him up to go on to the next phase of his journey 
uh, well-supplied, well-equipped, well-rested, well-supported. But if you'll permit me to allegorize a little bit here, uh, I think we can make the same application to our own relationships with one another in the church. We are together on a journey towards greater holiness. I hope that's how you see the Christian life. That you are making a long, concerted journey towards the kingdom of God. And it's a good, God-pleasing thing if on that journey, we as a family of friends encourage one another, spur one another on. That we hope to see one another be well supplied. That we would reach the end of this journey faithfully. And it's a difficult journey, and it's a God-pleasing thing if we encourage one another along the way. We're called to take up our cross in a manner worthy of Jesus and die to ourselves, deny ourselves so that we might look like Christ. Tragically for Jesus, when he literally took up his cross, you know what happened among his friends. In fear, they all abandoned him. He went alone on that journey. But I think at least one reason why God established the church was so that we could encourage and support one another on this journey of self-denial and sanctification. So we could find endurance and strength through the relationships that we have, the friends around us cheering us on. I don't know what heaven will be like precisely. We only get some small glimpses in the New Testament. But I do hope that one of the things that I'll get to do when I enter heaven is make my way around to the friends and brothers and sisters and just say to them, thank you so much for the way that you supported me, the way that you prayed for me, the way that you encouraged me. Thank you so much for being someone who is committed to caring for my heart, who spurred me on towards the kingdom of God when that journey was challenging. But actually, there's no need to wait for that, right? Why not do that now? Why not uh, be encouraged to go speak those words to our friends even now? And I hope that at least some of you in this room have already at various points heard me express my gratitude to you for your prayers and your encouragement and your friendship and your support. So although at this point our church is not physically sending anybody out on a missionary journey, we can still do well to support one another, sending one another on this journey towards greater godliness in a manner that glorifies God. And good friendships look like that. This is part of what it means to belong to a forever fellowship, a family of friends where we exhort and encourage one another in love. And I pray that our church will be like that. Moving on then in verses 9 through 11, we get a negative example. What not to do. An ugly contrast. There's healthy relationships like we see between John and Gaius. And there are ugly relationships. Behaviors that ruin the fellowship of God's people. John talks about this guy Diotrephes and a list of sins that disrupt and destroy the family of God. Maybe you picked up on these. Diotrephes is guilty of selfishness. John says he puts himself first. There's no place for that in God's people. He's guilty of pride and arrogance because he refuses to acknowledge the authority of John, who is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He talks wicked nonsense. I like the way that wickedness and nonsense are connected. And he's combative. He's divisive. He's discontent. He has an inhospitable heart. And he is engaging in enmity. Man, eternity in heaven is going to be a wonderful place because none of those behaviors will be present among God's people in the kingdom of God. But We shouldn't wait for heaven, for eternity, to strive for a community that looks like that among the people of God. Let us strive even now in our fellowship to rid ourselves of these kinds of sins so that God's people might experience the joy of true friendship and a healthy church family dynamic. 
In contrast to Diotrephes, let me give you two strong proofs of a sincere Christian faith present in someone's heart. And we've seen these, if, if you were paying attention, they pop up in John's short letter. Christians are people who are other-centered. I mean, think about your heart right now. Would you honestly be able to describe yourself as the kind of person who is other-centered? The heart of Christians is constantly concerned for the good of other people. And this flows out of our fellowship, our friendship with God himself. The community that we belong to as believers is modeled after the community of the Trinity of God. God is three in one. And each person in the Trinity, fully God, is committed to being other-centered to the other members of the Trinity. And that creates a unity that is beyond human comprehension. And when the Spirit of God dwells in the people of God, God makes us like him in this way. The best friendships are those where you know that your friend is watching out for you, looking out for you. And a healthy family is one where everyone knows that the other members are committed to the good of each other person. And this is godliness, to have an other-centered heart. Selfishness is no part of the kingdom of God. Second would just be humility. Diotrephes is swollen with pride. He's arrogant. He's abusive in the way that he treats others. And life-giving fellowship is quickly destroyed where the sin of pride is present in people's lives. I'm sure you know this as well from personal experience. Humility builds fellowship. And the reason is because a humble person has a very low uh, regard for themselves. They have a low view of their own importance. A humble Christian believes Jesus is important. And they believe that sincerely pointing other people towards Jesus is important. And supporting them in that journey of growing in Christ-likeness is important. I think Andrew Murray says it nicely when he talks about humility. He says, humility is perfect quietness of heart. It is to expect nothing, to wonder at nothing that is done to me, to feel nothing done against me. Humility is to be at rest when nobody praises me and when I am blamed or despised. It's to have a blessed home in the Lord where I can go and shut the door and kneel to my Father in secret and I am at peace as in a deep sea of calmness when all above is trouble. I think what he's driving towards is that humility doesn't think about itself at all because humility is too busy thinking about God, considering Christ. And a family of friends built around the humility of Jesus Christ, that's a divinely beautiful thing to be a part of. To no longer feel the need to strive for your own good outcome because you don't think about yourself anymore. You think about God and you think about others. Strong, lasting friendships are built around people who are humbly other-centered, who have tender hearts. And these things, they reflect the family of God. And the more that we walk in them and practice them here, the more robust we will be, the more prepared we will be to live like that for eternity before the throne of God. All right, finally, we get to our last couple of verses, 12 through 15. And I want to, feel, I want to point out that John feels bold to testify to the character of Demetrius. He's sending a letter of recommendation and he's confident that he can put his own reputation on the line before his friend Gaius in support of Demetrius. And the reason is because he actually knows him. I think it's fair to say he actually knows Demetrius because of something that John alludes to in verse 14. Just as John longs to spend time with Gaius face to face, John is the kind of guy who spends time in relationship face to face with people. He spent time with Demetrius face to face, and therefore he actually knows Demetrius. Their relationship is not superficial, it's genuine. 
So again, permit, permit me to point out two things here. First, notice right now, you're not face-to-face with anybody in this room except me. You're sitting side-by-side side with people. And I, wanna, I want you to understand that true Christian friendships cannot develop during a worship service because we don't spend time face-to-face with one another. Now, I'd like to think that the reason the church has sat like this for so many centuries is because the goal in a worship service is to bring you face-to-face, not with the pastor or the worship team, but ultimately with God. I think that's the goal, and growth takes place in that. Our goal is to look to Christ through his word, through the singing of worship songs as we praise him, and in being face-to-face with God, we grow in maturity. But that only further supports the point that true Christian fellowship happens most outside of the worship service. You know, if you come to church two minutes before church begins and you sit and you join us in worship and then as soon as that benediction is done, you split and you're out the door and you don't participate in any of our midweek things women's groups, men's groups, family churches, times that we just get together and hang out at the park, or you don't proactively invite other folks from church to come over or meet up for lunch or something like that, then the truth is you don't actually know what it means to belong to the family of God. You attend church. You might be a Christian, but unless you're experiencing some face-to-face time with other folks from this fellowship, you're missing out on a huge piece of what it means to be a Christian. You're worshiping God, but you're not really belonging to the family of God. You're with us, but since you're not known by any of us, we would have a hard time calling you friend. We would have a hard time calling you a family member. And what I'm trying to do here is just prevent anyone from being deceived into thinking that you belong to the fellowship of God because you attend a church service. John can write a recommendation for Demetrius because I believe they've spent time face to face. And the family of friends that we belong to requires that we see each other face to face. And as Christians who are humble and other-centered, we are eager to be blessed through godly relationships. And we should seek those opportunities out. We should hunger for that. The second thing quickly is that I just need to tell you, I hope you already know this, but let me just say it explicitly. Social media is not sufficient to testify to the character of other people. It lacks intimacy. Don't think that if you interact with folks on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or TikTok that you could actually give an endorsement for somebody because you've not had a face-to-face relationship with them. I'm not wholesale condemning those things. Those are nifty ways to keep in touch with some people, but they're not friendship and they're not fellowship. They're very poor substitutes for those things. And so if you, here's my encouragement, if you're one of those people who spent a ton of time on one of these social media platforms over the last week, this would be my challenge to you. Um, Deactivate them for the next couple of weeks. Try and calculate the number of minutes or hours you would have spent on those platforms and reach out to folks in our church community and instead invest that time face-to-face with them around your table or I would say at a park, but it's a little hot for that over a cup of coffee, wherever the case may be. But invest that time into face-to-face relationships with people. All right, so I want you to know the church is supposed to be a family of friends. And I sincerely believe that if, if we fail to achieve that standard, then all that we end up being is sort of a loose association of anonymous people. We are supposed to knit our hearts together in Christ Jesus, not just attend church. And the friendships that you develop here, the fellowship that we are seeking to build here, it's going to last forever in the kingdom of God. Forever and ever and ever. The work of building friendships here in the body of Christ, it is some of the most meaningful work that you will ever do in your entire life. 
That's something worth investing in. It brings God great joy and great glory to see his people share in one heart and one mind because of their unity in Christ. And so I think I'll close with just a reflection question. What keeps you from seeking fellowship here? What is the obstacle that prevents you from developing friendships and seeing the people in this room as truly your extended family? What prevents you from showing hospitality to others, welcoming them into your heart and into your life, sharing your life with your brothers and sisters in this room? I mean, I can anticipate some of those answers. I think they're excuses, but it's we're just too busy, right? I mean, we got sports and responsibilities and work and all these obligations. We're too busy. Or maybe the other one is, I'm too afraid. Would anybody in this room even actually like me if they really knew who I was? What if they came in my house and there were dishes in the sink? Would they judge me for it? You know, maybe you're just fearful Or maybe you're too self-reliant. Maybe you're one of those people who realizes that relationships are messy and you, you just don't want to get involved in the mess. Or maybe you're just lazy. Maybe you're self-centered. Maybe you just don't care to have relationships with other believers. Well, my prayer this morning and throughout this week has been that God would, would just move in your heart right now in this moment. To bring some conviction and some encouragement to overcome those excuses, whatever they may be, so that you would begin to value the fellowship of friends, this family that you belong to. And I hope that you'll leave here resolved to at least attempt to overcome some of those obstacles, to commit yourself to building friendships at church to seeing yourself as a part of this family of friends that we belong to. And I pray that as you make that change and you make that commitment, that God will simply bless you as you seek to be a more committed part of this family of friends, this forever fellowship. Let's pray together. God, we do need your help in overcoming these obstacles. Life is busy and relationships are risky. People can be dangerous and hurtful, and and we can also be proud and self-centered. So, Lord, we confess those things to you now. And God, I pray that we would be the kind of people who see the friendships that we're investing in now as an effort to store up some eternal treasure in the kingdom of God. Jesus, you even told your disciples that you call them friends. And I thank you that we too have been called friends, friends of God. And I pray that out of that friendship with you, we would extend a heart of welcome, hospitality, fellowship, that we would seek to build friends and belong to this family, not just attend church, but to truly see ourselves as one, one heart and one mind in Christ Jesus. Lord, would you just give us the grace to overcome some of those objections? that we might truly experience the joy of the forever fellowship that you have brought between your people. In Christ's name, amen.